In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Bless the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now at the hour of our death. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful by lay the Holy Spirit, grant that by the same Spirit may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Glory be to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lady of Fatima, St. Joseph, St. Jacinta, St. Francisco, all God's angels and saints, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Good afternoon. So uh, a couple of reminders before we enter into our our conversation, and it's uh, next Saturday is the big day. So next Saturday is the big day of the consecration. So a reminder that uh, that day we'll have a mass. Okay, we'll have the mass here. We'll have first communions uh, in Spanish next week and the following week. But we'll be we'll be ready to go at about twelve o'clock. Uh, a reminder also, your consecration will be done in such a way that you're going to have a scapular, so I invite you all to bring your own scapular. Uh, many of you already wear your scapular, but that'll be the external way in which we consecrate ourselves to Mary, the scapular. You probably know there are many scapulars, but this is the scapular of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, okay? The brown scapular. You got the red, you got the green, you got so many different, but the one is uh, the scapula from Our Lady Mount Carmel. So if you don't have one, you have a, a week to buy one or to make one, okay? Then wear that scapula always and wear that as, a, as your sign of consecration to Mary. It's uh, part of our consecration is that. And if you remember the last apparition, we didn't have time to explain that Our Lady, of Mount Carmel, Our Lady of Mount Carmel appears. Our Lady of Mount Carmel with her scapular appears, so she wants us to pray the rosary as well as to wear the scapular. All right. Now, uh, today happens also to be the first Saturday of June. So it's a very special day. It's the first Saturday of June. And um, next Saturday will be the feast day of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And the day before will be the Solemnity of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. So very beautiful day to consecrate ourselves on the Immaculate Heart of Mary, which follows the Sacred Heart of Jesus. So that day should be very important for you the rest of your lives, remember that you consecrate your family on the feast day of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And there are two places where we have to seek refuge in our lives. We want to seek refuge in the Immaculate Heart of Mary and the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Amen? Yes. Seeking refuge in the two hearts, the two hearts that love us so very much. To um, encourage you, um, I'd like to go through the conditions that a lady asked for first Saturday related to receiving a plenary indulgence. And then I'd like to get into our topic today. Our topic today is an extension of the topic we had last week. In this sense, last week we talked partially about the importance of reparation. 
to offer our prayers of reparation for the many sins that are committed. So this week will be an extension of that. We'll see how. But um, today being the first Saturday of the month, a lady told Lucia in a subsequent apparition to live the, the five first Saturdays. So five first Saturdays in a row, and you got the nine first Fridays, in which she wants those who love her to make a confession, either, either a week before or a week after that day. So if you're going to confession this week, fine. If not, within the next week. Then to attend Mass, attend Mass on the first Saturday, and some of you have already gone. If not, you can actually go tonight, even though tonight is Corpus Christi, but still that this would count for your first Saturday. We have a Mass at 6 p.m. Uh, then to make a communion of reparation. So not only to receive communion, but you're making a, a communion of reparation. And we'll explain the different areas that Mary wants us to offer that prayer of reparation. There's specific sins that hurt her heart, certain sins that wound the heart of Mary. We want to try to console the heart of Mary. Maybe it's never really occurred to you, Mary comes to console us, but she, but we want, she wants us to console her too. For many of us, we want her consolation, but we should try to console her. You know, much, love has to be a, a mutual exchange, no? Then, of course, you want to pray your rosary. Pray for the Pope. And make the decision that we want to give up sin. Because sin is our worst enemy. Even though we are sinners, we have to try to avoid the near occasion of sin. Avoid any person, place, Thing, circumstance that could be a slippery slope such that we slip into sin. And all of us, we know ourselves by now. We know, we know our kryptonite because many of you have done the exercises in several times. You've talked many times about your kryptonite. What is your, what is your weak point? Keep away from that. Now, if all those are done, you receive a plenary indulgence. Now, what is a plenary indulgence? That means that, say for example, you go to confession and the priest gives you absolution, you carry out the penance. Okay, you're forgiven of those sins. But it doesn't mean that your temporal punishment has been, has been, uh, pardoned or washed away. So there's two things, is, is forgiveness and temporal punishment. That might be a novelty for some of you, never heard that before. But forgiveness comes through absolution, but we might have to carry out other practices, prayer, penance, fasting, to repair for our past sins. A plenary indulgence forgives the sin as well as it takes away all the pun temp temporal punishment due to the sins. So if you were to die after making a plenary indulgence, that means you go right to heaven, no purgatory. I think all of us want that, right? Uh, will we have that? Well, we can pray for that grace. 
I think we should have a great desire to want to go to heaven right away. God wants us to go right away, but sometimes we don't will to go to heaven right away because we're too attached. We're too attached to the persons, places, things. We're still somewhat attached to our sin. We have to be detached from that. Okay, so uh, I thought I would bring in that, that very beautiful, consoling thought that I hope that all of you within the next week will prepare yourself that on your consecration you will receive a plenary indulgence, your whole family. Okay? And it'll be like being born again, like being baptized. And theologically, we've talked about this among priests, the difference between that and the divine mercy privilege, there's really no difference, no? So in a certain sense, you don't have to wait until Divine Mercy Sunday to start a new life. You can, you can, you can prepare yourself for a plenary indulgence anytime. So uh, we want to go to Mary with a clean heart, right? All right, so the topic today is, is going to be a little bit different than the others in the sense that in Mariology, there has to be a harmonious blend between what is called doctrine and devotion. Okay? There has to be a harmonious blend between doctrine and devotion if you want to have a um, integral Mariology. In the Prior talks, I spent more time on the devotional part, which is important. Try to imagine you go to Olive Garden to get a salad, and they don't give you the salad dressing. I love the Olive Garden salads, don't you? <laughs> They're the best in the world, aren't they? No? But if they don't bring that salad dressing, hey, Waiter, waitress. <laughs> and once you put that salad dressing on with the bacon and the salt and the pepper, oil and vinegar, ah. I see two parlos dedos, as they say in Spanish, huh? Well, that's Mariology. You have to have the doctrine is a salad, the devotion is a salad dressing. So you go home and say, what did Father Groom talk about? He talked about olive garland and salads. <laughs> it's the only thing you remembered, huh? But you didn't recognize there's an analogy, huh? <laughs> so the sins against the Immaculate Heart of Mary that we want to repair for are five. And three of them are Marian dogmas. Three of them are Marian dogmas. Okay, just that you're aware, to complete your Mariology, there are four Marian dogmas, and they would be the Immaculate Conception, the Divine Maternity, the perpetual virginity of Mary, and then the last would be Mary's assumption into heaven. There has been a strong movement in the church to beg the Holy Father to proclaim the fifth dogma. It hasn't happened yet. Well, Holy Father is not ready for it yet, but it could happen in the future. In the fifth Marian dogma, and probably the strongest advocate of this is uh, Mark Miravalli from Steubenville. Okay? Mark Miravalli is probably one of the most noteworthy Mariologists in the country who taught my little sister when she went to Steubenville. Uh, he's a Mariologist. 
and they're trying to put together the third Marian dogma would be combining Mary as mediatrix of all graces, Mary as co-redemptrix, and Mary as coadjutrix. Three titles that you can find in Lumen Gentium chapter eight. Okay? Lumen Gentium is one of the dogmatic constitutions from Vatican II. And it has eight chapters, and the eighth chapter is the one dedicated to, to Mary as Matra Ecclesia, Mary as the mother of the church. So we have the four, the Immaculate Conception, the Divine Maternity, Perpetual Virginity, and the Assumption of Mary to Heaven. Okay, so let's go through these, these sins against the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So you wanna to get to know them and basically Console Mary and tell Mary you're sorry for those people in the world that reject these dogmas or make fun of these dogmas or are ignorant of these dogmas. Okay, there are many ways in which these uh, Marian privileges can be offended. We want to we console the heart of Mary and a good way for you to Console Mary is they get to know these dogmas and to love them. Know them, study them, and love them. In fact, anyone who really loves Mary should know the four Marian dogmas. Anyone asks you about Mary, all of us should, not that we're going to be speaking as a theologian, but be able to explain in simple catechetical terms the Marian dogmas. So that's a good way you can console the heart of Mary is to teach others, and 95% of the Catholics don't know them, right? maybe 98%. Probably a lot of you don't know them, but hopefully after today you will know them, okay? Okay, so let's, um, uh, I'm gonna go through them quickly for lack of time, and then you can maybe study them, get to know them better, and talk about Mary. Tell, tell people about these Marian privileges. So let's go, let's go chronologically. Okay? Chronologically means in historical order, okay? chronologically. The first obviously is the Immaculate Conception. The Immaculate Conception. So I'll be going at a pretty quick pace because in one hour, this would merit four hour talks. Okay, what is the Immaculate Conception? The Immaculate Conception is this. It's a privilege that was given to Mary. And it means that Mary, in the moment of her conception, in the very moment of her conception, she was preserved. Preserved is the word that's used in the papal document, okay? From Pius IX, Ineffabilius Deus, which would be the papal bull that came out in 1854. She was preserved, preserved from the stain of original sin, preserved. Now, for our future theologians here, for you to understand the Immaculate Conception, it's impossible to understand the Immaculate Conception without understanding original sin. It's impossible. If you don't have a good grasp on original sin, you're not gonna understand the Immaculate Conception. But if you understand original sin, and I'm pretty sure all of you understand it pretty well, then that's a foundation for understanding the Immaculate Conception. Original sin, Genesis chapter three, in which Adam and Eve, they disobeyed God, and that is called original sin, which is the first sin that was committed in, in this world. The first sin was committed with the sin of the angels, but the first sin on planet Earth was that of Adam and Eve. Now, because of that, 
Because I had original sin, what about us? I was somewhat of an inquisitive child. I would sometimes say, why do I have to have original sin? Adam and Eve did it. Why do I have to have it? I think any inquisitive child would probably ask that question. They committed it. Why do I have to be born with it? So in the moment, in the moment of our conception, what happens? The moment of conception, the poison of original sin, that's ours, no? It's a contagion, it's a poison. In the very moment of our conception, because of Adam and Eve. Now, Mary was the only one, as well as Jesus, of course, that never had the stain of original sin. All of you who are experts in English poetry and literature, you're probably going, you probably have read, have read Wordsworth. What does Wordsworth say? It says that Mary is our tainted nature's solitary boast. Beautiful. That's William Wordsworth, a famous English Protestant poet. He was a Protestant. <laughs> so Mary is our tainted nature's solitary boast. Our tainted nature means that we have been stained and tainted because of original sin. Not Mary, though. Not Mary. So there in the moment of her conception, she was preserved from original sin. And as a result of that, her whole life, Mary was impeccable. Her whole life, Mary never committed even the smallest venial sin. Smallest venial sin, a white lie, no. Nope. Bad thought, no. Nope. Laziness, no. Gluttony, never. Not even the slightest. And all the inspirations that God sent Mary, she always said yes to them. We, maybe half the time. Okay? Soon as Mary received an inspiration from the Holy Spirit, right away she said yes. So the closer we get to Mary, the more she's going to be sharing with us this privilege, the more she's going to be moving us away from sin. And that's interesting. You get close to Mary, she's going to be moving us away from sin. You're going to have more trials and tribulations and crosses. That's part of the game, no? But the reality of sin, Mary is going to be pushing us away from it. And pushing us away from sin and pushing us toward Christ. Okay. It's a very important privilege, especially for, for, for us that live in this country, because the patroness of the United States is the Immaculate Conception. Did you know that? Yeah. She's our patroness. The most beautiful church in the United States is the Basilica of the Immaculate Conception in Washington, D.C. Have any of you ever gone there? I have. Isn't it beautiful? It, it's in a class by itself. You ever in Washington, D.C., go to the Basilica of the Immaculate Conception. It's, it's our claim to fame. Beautiful. So we celebrate this beautiful solemnity every year on December 8th. It also, she's also the patroness of the Philippines. Did you know that? Some of the Philippines didn't know that. Yeah, she's the patroness also of the, of the Philippines. Okay, so honoring the Mac Conception, Mary's going to share with us that privilege and help us to have a repugnance towards sin, very ignatian, repugnance towards sin. We want to keep away from sin as a, as a plague. Okay, a way in which we can honor this 
is by saying this prayer. And this prayer, hopefully all of us will have this memorized. O Mary, conceive without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. Have you ever prayed that prayer? O Mary, conceive without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. If you speak Spanish, uh, you have also this Ave Maria Purissima. Yeah. You know a little bit of Spanish. No? Ave Maria Purissima is a way in which we honor the Immaculate Conception in Espanol, okay? Ave Maria Purissima, some of you speak Spanish, huh? A concrete way in which we can honor the Immaculate Conception by wearing your scapular, uh, and my mother sews scapulars and she, my scapular, she sewed the miraculous medal inside it as well as the medal of St. Benedict. Huh? So I got the rosary in my pocket, scapular, St. Benedict, the miraculous medal. I'm a walking sacramental, huh? <laughs> the devil wants to shoot me. I'm pretty well protected, no? The miraculous medal. If you really want to get to know more of the history of the Miraculous Medal, okay, read the life of St. Catherine Labor Laboret, okay? St. Catherine Laboret. Of all the approved Marian apparitions, it's not, as, it's not as famous as Guadalupe or Lourdes or Fatima, but if it weren't for that apparition, we wouldn't have the medal. Where did this take place? It took place in, in Paris. If you speak French, Rue de Bac in Paris. And it was in the Visitation Convent. And there was a nun whose name was Sor Catherine Labore. Think about that. She was, she was in bed and someone came into her room and woke her up. It was her guardian angel. So how would you like that as, a, as your alarm clock? Your guardian angel gets you up and says, someone is waiting for you. Someone is waiting for you in the church. So she gets up, dresses, she goes in the church. Guess who is waiting for her? It was the Blessed Mother. And she was sitting in the prayer with the, uh, sitting in the chair where the priest sits. It's called the presidential chair. And Catherine comes in, she's shocked. And Our Lady does this. A little bit closer, a little bit closer, a little bit closer, still closer. And she falls to her knees and puts her hands in the lap of the Blessed Mother. There's never been an apparition so intimate and close because you don't have any seers touching Mary. In Guadalupe, Mary's, Mary's up there. In Fatima, she's up on the top of a, an oak tree. In Lourdes, she's in a grotto. Or this one, she actually puts her hands in the lap of Mary. And they have a wonderful conversation. That's what you should be doing in this consecration. You should be arriving at a point where you want to talk to Mary as your best friend, as your model, as your guide, as your inspiration, as your life, as your sweetness, as your hope. You want to have that intimate relationship with Mary. Now you pray your rosary, yeah. Then then talk to Mary from your heart. Tell her what's going on. She'll listen. And Mary tells her to have the, mirac that the miraculous medal made. So the technical name of the medal is the Medal of the Immaculate Conception, but it's commonly known as the Miraculous Medal because of the so many miracles that have come because of it. I'll tell you one. Probably around 1974, 74, 
my parents had moved from New Jersey to Massachusetts. And my mom and one of her best friends were aware of an abortion clinic not too far away from the house. So what they did was they, on the sly, okay, on the sly, without anyone there, they drew close to the abortion clinic and they put a miraculous medal um, in the crack in between the, uh, the bricks. And then they went to the church, uh, a church, their Catholic church, and they prayed the rosary, they made a holy hour, and about a week afterward, the abortion clinic closed down. So it's a real story like the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. These two humble little women, housewives with big families. No, 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 no. Abortion is wrong. We're gonna have Mary close this down. And it happened. So that's just one of many, many, many miracles that happened. And it's not so much the medal, but it's the faith of my mom and her friend. The medal too. But the, fact, the fact that they had so much faith that Mary is so powerful that she could close down the doors and the walls of this place that kills babies. Okay, so we want to, uh, there are a lot of ramifications in the Macca conception, but that's, that's sufficient. Let's move into the other four. The second the second privilege that we want to offer up reparation for. Remember, we're trying to offer up reparation for the sins and the offenses against these great Marian privileges would be Mary's divine maternity. Mary's divine maternity. So when we say divine maternity, it means this. That Mary, Mary's motherhood. Now, of all Mary, of, of, of all Mary's privileges, and God gave Mary so many beautiful privileges. The greatest privilege that God gave to Mary is her divine maternity. Is her motherhood. Therefore, every time you say the Hail Mary, and you say. Holy Mary, Mother of God. When you say Mother of God, Mary rejoices. In the Hail Mary, the whole Hail Mary is important, but that's probably the most important part of the Hail Mary. When you say Hail Mary, Mother of God. Just here where that was proclaimed in the year 431 in the Council of Ephesus, where Mary lived with St. John the Evangelist, according to tradition, after Jesus went to heaven. And she was proclaimed the Theotokos. That's the Greek for the God bearer, Theotokos. Tokos carry Theo God, the Christopher, the God bearer. So we want to offer up reparation for those who deny Mary's divine maternity or they make fun of it, or they insult it in one way or another. So let me give you a way in which we can honor the divine maternity of Mary. I think what you're gonna hear, you're gonna love this. We have a lot of people who are of Mexican descent way in which you can honor it is by honoring Our Lady of Guadalupe. You know why? Because Mary's pregnant. Do you know that? That, that black ribbon, in the time of Juan Diego, pregnant women in Mexico would wear a black ribbon. 
Look how high it is. December 12th, count 13 days. What's that? December 25th, right? So she's right, she's right about the time to bring forth the child Jesus. So by honoring, by honoring Our Lady Guadalupe, we're, we're honoring her divine maternity. Okay, very interesting story. Uh, this man was in my mom and dad's house more than once. My mom and dad have had a lot of very interesting guests, you know, priests, bishops. His name is Dan Lynch. Dan Lynch is the most famous uh, person in this country with the pilgrim, uh, the pilgrim Virgin of Guadalupe, which he goes all over the country bringing the image of Our Lady Guadalupe. So he went to the Basilica of Guadalupe and asked if they could lend him Our Lady Guadalupe. And they said, we're not going to give that to anyone, no? So they gave him a replica. And the replica, the replica is, almost looks the same. So he did this for probably a good 30 years. He might be retired now, but he did it for many, many years, traveling throughout the country. So he's in one parish, and he's giving a talk. And you can just Google in EW10 Dan Lynch. You can get, he's been on EW10 many times, and um, explaining the different details of Our Lady Guadalupe. So he's giving a talk, and you got this mother with her little daughter. The daughter says to the mother, Mommy, look, the tummy of Mary's moving. The tummy of Mary's moving. So the mother, who was a nurse, said, that's not possible. But the little kid said, look, moving. And the mother being a nurse, you know, your eyes are, are playing, uh, playing tricks on you. But the little kid kept insisting, and the mother went up to the replica, and she had a stethoscope. So she put the stethoscope over the image of Our Lady Guadalupe, and guess what she heard? She heard the, the heartbeat of a little baby beating from the image itself. Wow. Incredible story, isn't it? Well documented. So that's a way in which we can be honoring the divine maternity by honoring Our Lady Guadalupe. And if you've ever done some walking in front of abortion clinics. Some of you have probably done it. Almost always they're lifting up the image of Our Lady Guadalupe as the patroness of pro-life. She's the patroness of pro-life because she said yes to life and she brought forth Jesus who's the way, the truth, and the life. So you got that? Okay, let's move on. The third Marian privilege is what is called Mary's perpetual virginity. This is where we have the fight with the Protestants, huh? Mary's perpetual virginity. This is a Marian dogma that Mary was virgin before the birth of Jesus, during the birth of Jesus, and after the birth of Jesus. Those three moments. It's good that you're able to explain this to, to people because there's some, even here are some Catholics that doubt this, no? Interiorly, I get angry at that. I try not to manifest exteriorly because, number one, it's a dogma. If it's a dogma, it's a truth of the faith. Number two, uh, God can work miracles. God can work miracles in any way he wants. 
And number three is very beautiful in a world that rejects the virtue of purity. Yep. So Mary is the patroness of mothers and virgins. Yep. So before the birth, even the Protestants have to accept this, in Luke chapter 1, I think it's verse 26, that Mary conceived Jesus how? Through the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit. In Hebrew, that's called the Shekinah, the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit. So the Protestants have to accept that because that's, that's in the Bible. So the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary as she conceived through the power of the Holy Spirit. For that reason, we say Mary is the daughter of God the Father, Mary is the mother of God the Son, and Mary is the mystical spouse of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. That's not simply poetic, but it's real. Holy Spirit is the mystical spouse of Mary. Okay, what about during the birth? If you've ever seen Protestant films, they'll show when Mary's bringing forth Jesus, Mary's writhing in pain and she's yelling, that's, that's wrong. That's wrong. Okay, we have some mothers here. When you brought forth your children, was there any pain involved? Or was that just a figment of your imagination? A little bit of pain? Probably a lot. No? When Mary brought forth Jesus, was there any pain? No. She didn't have the immaculate conception. She didn't have original sin, did she? She didn't have original sin, so she didn't have to suffer the pain of childbirth. So you're going to be seeing some films that Mary's writhing in pain, she's yelling out. That's uh, not the way it happened. The best image I've ever uh, read is, is the following. You're going to love it. Try to imagine you're at home. It's uh, 12 noon. You open up the drapes. Okay, and it's midday. And the sun the sun is entering into your room. Okay, does the sun break the windows? But the sun gets in, right? So just as the sun can pass through the windows at midday without breaking the windows, so Jesus came out of the Blessed Virgin Mary without losing her virginity. Beautiful, huh? Think about that. Beautiful, isn't it? So the sun is beaming through the windows without breaking the windows. Jesus was born and rested in the arms of Mary. Well, how about the third moment after birth? The Protestant will say, well, the Bible says that once Jesus was preaching, and someone cried out, Lord, your mother, your brother, and your sisters are seeking you. Uh-oh. How are you going to explain that? Well, I can say, I can say that Grace is my sister. Mary is my sister. Jessica is my sister. I can say, Juan is me, mi hermano. Yeah. I can say, Mimi is my sister. That's very true. Because we're not biological brothers and sisters, but we're brothers and sisters in Jesus and Mary. This is called the spiritual family. We all form a spiritual family. God is our father, Jesus is our brother, and Mary is our mother. So Mary did not have any other biological children. 
but spiritual children, millions, we're among them. We're among them. John chapter 19, Jesus said to his mother, woman, behold thy son, son, behold thy mother. From that moment, the beloved disciple took Mary into his home, which means his heart, as well as his home in Ephesus. So it's a question of knowing language, the biblical language, as well as the biblical context, and knowing how to manage these biblical verses properly. But Mary had one biological child, and that was Jesus Christ. Right? Okay, so those are the three Marian dogmas that we want to we want to honor and defend. And one way in which we can honor and defend the perpetual virginity of Mary is for all of us to strive, to strive for greater purity of life. And purity, not simply in a sexual way, that too, but purity of eyes, of mind, of thought, of, of intention, purity of heart, purity of life, which is a very, very difficult virtue today. Impossible without the grace of God. All of us are called to live that out. Living out the Beatitude, Matthew 5, 8, Jesus says, blessed are the pure of heart, for they will see God. If you've ever read the diary of St. Faustina, Kowalska, once Jesus appears to her dressed in white, in a white robe, and Jesus places, it's like a, a stole around her waist, a sash. You know what happened in that moment? God gave her the grace of perfect chastity that she never had any bad thoughts again, nor even movements of the flesh. Wow. Can you imagine that? But St. Faustina said this, she had been begging the Blessed Mother for that gift for a long time. So the great St. Faustina, who lived a very whole life, eh, she didn't attain that right away. It took many prayers, many rosaries, many sacrifices. But really, this is kind of where the rubber hits the road. This is the, this is the sin where the devil has most inroads. And Our Lady Fatima is going to say, remember July 13th? We talked about that, right? She said, most souls are lost because of sins against purity. And then she showed right, the vision of hell. Now, if you think that you're really living this, you, th you think you're living this in the perfect way, Hold your horses. You, know, you might have some good days, good weeks, and all of a sudden, hell, all hell breaks loose. No? We, always we always have to be guard. We always have to be vigilant over our eyes, our mind, our affections, our heart, and our social relationships. We're soldiers in battle. Yeah. We're soldiers in battle. And the battle isn't over until it's over. So I see these Marian privilege is very applicable to us today. Very much so. Okay, now the fourth, okay, the fourth is not a Marian dogma, but it's, um, it's something very dear to the heart of Mary. We want to beg for forgiveness and make acts of reparation for the sins against the images of Mary. Sins against the images of Mary. Sins against the images of Mary. Okay, so, so all of you remember, we're already in June, 
uh, 11 months ago, this country, you remember, went on rampage against images. Remember that? It was in July. And for, for about three, three or four months, almost every week you're hearing about some images, image that was being damaged. Remember? And men, many of them were, mar were, were marrying statues and uh, paintings. The most famous would be, you probably remember, up there in San Francisco in the statue of Junipero Serra. Remember that? There's a statue of Junipero Serra up there in San Francisco that they, they tore down. Do any of you remember that? And the Archbishop Cordelione, he actually made an exorcism afterward. Remember? Yeah, this was back about 11 months ago. Uh, that was probably almost like the domino that started. And then you have almost all over the country, you hear these people that are tearing down statues of the saints, entering into churches, cutting off the head of Mary, using you know, graffiti, and it's still happening today, that really hurts the heart of Mary. It really hurts the heart of Mary. Now, I know this is going to be painful, but um, if you were to go into my room, and um, among the many things that I have, I have a lot, a lot of paintings of saints and Mary, the Sacred Heart. I mean, it almost looks like a, a Catholic museum, no? But I have... Uh, at least four or five portraits of my mom and my dad. You have one when I celebrated my 25th anniversary 10 years ago, my dad was still living, no? And um, I, they're really well done. I look at them, I see the big smile on the face of my mom and my dad's next to her. If you were to take that and you were to break that, you'd probably be breaking my heart. You would. My dad passed away, and I still love my dad, but I have a great, uh, I have a great love for my mother. And you by spraying that or, or breaking it, you know, you're breaking my heart. I would forgive you, but there would be a wound there, right? So I'm saying that, I know it's painful, but if that hurts my heart because of my mother, what about our Heavenly Mother? I love my mom, but I love the Blessed Mother more than my mom. And my mom, my mom is not offended at that. <laughs> I have to have a proper order. So, um, we want to tell God we're sorry for the many times that people have, have profaned the images of Mary. Now, this is another huge topic but I had to say this out, the many modern movies that make fun of Jesus and Mary. One of the worst came out about 20 years ago, The Da Vinci Code, remember that? No, remember that? So there are modern movies that are presenting Jesus and Mary in a, in a very sacrilegious way profane way. So it, 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 this goes beyond the mere stature of painting. It can be in poetry, and can be in literature, it can be movies, it can be DVDs. Any way in which the image of Mary is being tarnished, we want to beg mercy and pardon for that. No? And all of us understand this. I mean, someone insults your mother. You insult my, you insult my mother, she, she got 39 grandchildren. <laughs> I, come from, I come from a huge family, you know. Oh, those 39, 39 grandchildren are going to be offended by your offending. What about the Heavenly Mother? And let me tell you, don't get angry at people because anger doesn't come from God. But uh, sorrow and pain, that's okay. 
getting angry and want to become vindictive and put up your dukes and duke it out. You're not going to get anywhere in that. We want to offer our prayers of reparation and a way in which we can honor to offer up reparation is to have in your home, in your car, beautiful images of Mary. Do you? Have beautiful images of Mary in your home, in your car, in your wallet. You know, we're not Jehovah Witnesses. We're not, we're not, uh, we don't believe in iconoclasm. We believe that images, we're not adoring the images, but we love what they represent. You look at a lady of Guadalupe, what are you thinking about? Mary's great love for us as our spiritual mother. Love for us as our spiritual mother. So that would be the fourth. Now the fifth, these are all ways in which Mary is offended. So when Mary appeared in Fatima, she appeared to three little children, Jacinta, Francisco, and Lucia, right? She appeared in Lourdes. She appeared to Bernadette, who was a young girl. This last one is we offer up reparation for those who damage the relationship between Mary and children. between Mary and children. And I think we can, we can interpret that in a very broad way. Modern educational programs that are trying to change the sexual identity of little children, I see that as a way of really offending Mary in a more extensive way. Trying to tell little boys they can be girls, little girls can, can be boys, and promoting that as something normal. Very, very offensive to God. Very offensive. That really hurts the heart of Mary. And the way the society is moving, we're going to have to confront that in one way or another. This year, confirmation, I taught, all, I taught all the confirmation classes here for about four months. And I gave one class on the sexual identity crisis. Yeah? And I thought it was one of the best classes I gave. Because if the parents don't speak about it, okay, I'm the catechist, I'm the priest. You're very clear talking of sexual identity. Mary wants us to have a very clear sense of who we are. We're created in the image and likeness of God. Through baptism, we're sons and daughters of God. We're created male or female. It was Adam and Eve, right? So that would be a very uh, broad interpretation of that. But uh, a more limited interpretation would be Okay, this, modern, modern Catholic catechesis that don't speak about Mary, or modern catechesis that make fun of the rosary. I've heard this many times. And very often it's supposed to be these these pseudo-intellectuals, I say pseudo, that means false intellectuals, is that they think that praying the rosary is something only for old abuelitas, no? It's for abuelitas, no? No, it says trying to convince children not to love Mary through the rosary is is very, very offensive to Jesus and to Mary. 
And after Vatican II, we have certain churches that would not have Marian statues. You just have to pray as if it were like a Quaker building. No, we want to do all we possibly can. So I'll mention three things we can do to try to repair for this. And I think now more than ever, children have to be consecrated to Mary because the times are tough. And it's not getting, it's not getting easy, any easier. Now more than ever, we have to consecrate the children to Mary. Now more than ever. So the first would be have the child baptized and then present the child to the Blessed Mother on the day of baptism. The second would be to, as, as mothers and fathers and grandparents, expose your children to really good movies on Mary. They're out there. Movies on Mary, Our Lady of Fatima, Our Lady of Lourdes, Our Lady of Guadalupe the documentary that came out about six months ago, Father Patrick Payton, pray. Very well done. Expose the children to good movies that are going to engrave in their little minds good images of Mary which they can fall in love with the Blessed Mother. And last but not least, and this is at the very heart of our program, Pray the rosary with your children. And pray the rosary even when they don't feel like praying the rosary, pray it anyway. Maybe if they say, we don't want to pray the rosary, okay, we'll pray two rosaries, okay? <laughs> okay, it's called the Aja de Contra, right? It's called the Aja de Contra. Not going to pray one, we'll pray two, okay? So don't say, well, we're not going to pray the role of prayer. We'll double it up, okay? And also give your children the scapular and have them wear the scapular all the days of their lives. So my friends, it's a wonderful presentation. We want to console the heart of Mary today. We want to console the heart of Mary by knowing and loving the Immaculate Conception. We're going to console the heart of Mary by honoring her greatest privilege, her divine maternity. She's the mother of God. We're going to honor Mary by her perpetual virginity and trying to live out this challenging virtue. We also want to honor Mary by honoring her images and repairing for those who have dishonored these images. We honor Mary, finally, by bringing the little children to Jesus and Mary. Amen? Amen. So God bless you. It's been a very beautiful course, and next week we'll be consecrating ourselves in the holy sacrifice of the Mass, which is the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So God bless you.